This is a presentation for anyone who has ever held back. If you've ever been reluctant about speaking up in a group, if you've ever wondered whether or not you should state your opinion, if you've ever felt too intimidated to offer your input, if you've ever been shut down or silenced, then this webinar is for you. In the award-winning Connect to Lead blog, we posted an article not too long ago about speaking up in the workplace. It rapidly became one of our top 10 downloads of all time, so apparently this is a need for a lot of people. You're not alone. In fact, as I work with teams in all sizes of organizations, I almost always encounter this. At least one person, and, and usually more, feels unable to express their opinion and fully participate in critical conversations. We'll talk about why that is and what you can do about it on your own. We won't be talking about what leaders and organizations can do to create a better environment. That's a whole different workshop. This one is for you, so that no matter what's happening in your environment, you can find and use your voice to assertively communicate your needs. I'm Deb Calvert, the founder of People First Productivity Solutions and the Connect community. We work to build organizational strength by putting people first, and we provide tools and support for leaders at every level. Isn't this ironic? I mean, you think about this. You were hired for your unique experience, your perspective, your education, and your ability to contribute. And yet, your employer isn't fully leveraging your talent and your expertise if they aren't receptive to and drawing out your opinion. Shame on them. But I have to say, you bear some responsibility here too. If your confidence is shaky, or if you aren't entirely comfortable speaking up, then you may be allowing those doubts to creep in and mask all you could be offering. Now make no mistake, I am not letting your managers and coworkers off the hook here. I personally think that we should all work together when it comes to being inclusive and hearing from every single member of the team. But even if your boss and your colleagues make it difficult for you, I'd like to challenge you to look for some ways to incrementally increase your volume, your frequency, and the caliber of your contributions. Don't let their wrongdoing keep you from making those contributions you were hired to make. Because the simple truth is this, your voice matters. There's only one you, and you have a right to use your voice. Not only that, but others have a right to hear what you have to say. Let's talk about why you should use your voice at work. First and foremost, probably the most obvious thing is that you either use it or, or lose it. But here are five benefits on top of that most obvious one. Um, that most obvious one, it matters. You don't want to lose your voice because you have needs. You have a right to express those needs. You have an obligation to pursue the needs that are best for your customers and for your colleagues. And as a contributing member of a team, you owe it to yourself and others to activate your voice and to participate in dialogue, even when it's not completely comfortable. Let's, let's liken this to a family or uh, to a group of friends. It would be unreasonable for you to be part of any group and expect that your needs would be fully understood and met if you didn't express what you needed. So if someone else in your family or in your social circle did not express their needs but still expected you to meet those needs, you would think that was unfair. Well, the workplace is no different, except for this one thing. We attach more weight 
to our words in the workplace. We navigate these relationships a, a little more cautiously. And we suppress our voice for a lot of reasons, many of them based on a sense that expressing ourselves could be risky in some way. So all of these benefits are at stake. If you aren't using your voice, you aren't experiencing job satisfaction, you aren't uh, having people seek out your opinion, you're not being included, you're not earning clout. All of these benefits are at stake because we are choosing to allow these things to get into our way instead. Well, it, it does come from somewhere. This isn't just your fault, <laughs> if you will. But, you know, from the very day that we're born, we receive certain signals, signals that suggest that using our voice is not always desirable. We become conditioned to suppress what we have to say. Consider this. Babies are shushed. Kids are supposed to be quiet at certain times while the adults are talking. And then you go to school, and school is very structured. We all take turns talking in a rigid, permission-based manner. And then maybe you go to college, and, and in college, communication is mostly one directional, as in the, the professor does all of the talking, especially in those large lecture halls. And then you enter the workplace, and it's usually pretty bureaucratic. Even the more relaxed workplace atmospheres seem to imply that you have to go through the proper channels. And no one seems to have the time. We're all conditioned to think that we can't ask for somebody else's precious time. So as a result of all of this conditioning, we hold back. It's confusing because no one gives you a new playbook and says, here's how we communicate here, and these are the expected ways and times that you will contribute. So mostly, we have to figure that out through trial and error which, of course, feels very risky. Now let's talk about those specific kinds of risks that you may have encountered. James Dietert is a professor at uh, Cornell's Johnson Graduate School of Management. He specializes in transparent communication in the workplace. He published an article last year in the Harvard Business Review, and it described why people hold back in the workplace. By the way, if you'd like to get a copy of that article written by James Dieter, there, there's a link on the sidebar of this web page where you got the webinar. Over there on the sidebar, you'll find a link to the article. That article is written for managers to help them create an environment where people will speak up more often. On top of that, if you're a manager who wants additional support in this, because that's not the focus of this webinar, but if you want more about that, just shoot me an email. I, I put my email address up there on screen. Now back to Dr. Dieter. He described five reasons and offered tips on how managers can help overcome these perceptions. However, he and others have also pointed out that this is supposed to be the work of every individual that by and large each of us must take responsibility for finding ways to use our own voices. So let me show you his five reasons here. Some of you may identify with these. Maybe you've experienced something like this in, in your workplace. The first one that comes from Dr. Dietert is that you might think that people won't like what you have to say. And if you don't think they will like what you have to say, you might also be thinking that you should be afraid, fearful of the response that you might get if you say it. Or it could be that you're just not really sure how to say it. Or maybe you feel like you've tried to say it before, but nobody was listening. Or for some reason, what you want to say just doesn't seem to be appropriate. So we'll take these five reasons one by one, each on its own slide, and we'll build these out. But be thinking about, for you, which of these cause you to hold back. And as we talk them through, think about some of the specific tips or some of the ideas that, that we discuss that you could actually go out and apply so that following this webinar, you can do something different no matter what's happening in the environment around you. 
the first one, that, that you might be concerned that they don't like what you have to say, well, so what? Seriously, so what if they don't like what you have to say? If what you're saying is important and brings to light something that has an impact worth noting, then that overrides the anticipated initial reaction. Put, put yourself in the other person's shoes. Although they might not want to hear a hard truth or an unpopular opinion, hearing it would be so much better than the alternative. Problems only get worse when people let them fester. Your silence may be contributing to the other person's loss of credibility, or your silence could cause them to make poor decisions because they don't have all the information. Let me give you an example. This is a true story, a current client that I'm working with. This is a senior leader of a team, and, and she's frequently out of the office. She travels a lot for business. Now, she has two people that she calls her lieutenants, and they are the ones that, that other people are supposed to go to in her absence. What she doesn't really know is that her lieutenants are both extremely stressed and overloaded, when she's gone. And they don't come across as being very receptive to helping people. So, of course, people avoid going to them. They wait until the senior leader returns, and that means that projects are frequently stalled out. Now, if you were this leader, wouldn't you want to know that the system you're relying on is, is broken? This wouldn't be about tattling on the lieutenants. This would be about seeing a problem and calling attention to it for the good of the entire organization. Right? There doesn't have to be a shame or blame component to this, only an objective observation that's made in the common interest of fixing things. Thinking of it in that way, one frontline employee decided that he would tell the senior leader what was going on. And, and he prepared himself. He was very thoughtful about the way he described the situation. He used specific examples. He showed empathy to everybody who was involved. And guess what? The senior leader was, at first, a little surprised and a little skeptical about what he was saying, especially because he was relatively new to the team, but also because she, she didn't want to believe it. But her awareness of his perspective caused her to look through a different lens and see things differently. It took a few weeks for this to sink in for her and start seeing it for herself. But she did. And at that point, she also came to see this employee in a whole new light. She named him Employee of the Month, and she recognized in public his courage and candor. She lightened the load on her lieutenants, and she set up a whole new check-in system most importantly, she established a no BS zone, and she asked people to start telling her the truth more often. She says it still isn't easy to hear certain perspectives, but that she really values knowing so she isn't like the emperor who was wearing no clothes. Now, I, I realize that's a long story, but here's the point. It all started with one brave voice who knew going in that she might not like what he had to say. He said it anyway because he thought, if I were in her shoes, I'd want to know. Well, the second reason that you might not speak up, especially if you think they won't like what you have to say, is the secondary concern. The secondary concern is, is not just the other way, way the other person feels about what you have to say, but what they might do as a result of that bad feeling when you express yourself to them. Now this is especially true if you've ever been on the receiving end of a bad reaction in the past or if you've seen someone else get backlash for speaking up. So let me give you a mental exercise. You can take yourself through this exercise before you decide whether or not to speak up. This is a way to decide more objectively so you aren't letting your fear be the driver of your decisions. That fear will only be an informer, a data point that helps you to support the decision. First of all, you'll ask yourself, 
what's the worst possible thing that could happen if I do speak up? And then you'll ask yourself, what's the best possible thing that could happen if I do speak up? You'll want to be proportioned and proportionate and, and objective as you evaluate those responses. And then ask two more questions. The next question is, what's the worst thing that could happen if I do not speak up? And what's the best possible thing that could happen if I do not speak up? Again, you want to be balanced here. Uh, let me give you an example. Let me walk you through what this might sound like. You might be saying to yourself, well, if I tell him about this problem, the worst thing that could happen is that he'll be really angry, he'll probably say something sarcastic, I'll feel bad, and, and I'll be left wondering if I've just committed career suicide. On the other hand, the best thing that could happen if I tell him is that we'll get this problem fixed, and that would save us all a lot of time. It would probably save the company some money, too, because our time is valuable. Ultimately, I think this would be better for customer satisfaction. That was your first set. Now let's look at the second set of questions. Continue to, to play this out as if you were thinking it through. On the other hand, if I don't tell him, the worst possible thing that could happen is that we would keep following this same frustrating and time-consuming process that puts some of our business at risk. We could lose talented people or even customers due to the frustration this causes for everybody. The best possible thing that could happen if I don't tell him is that I'll be safe from his reaction. Well, <laughs> here's the point. The anticipation of a certain response may not be the best criteria to use in making a decision about whether or not to speak up. We're going to talk about how to mitigate the risk of speaking up, but I first wanted to give you this alternate mental exercise so you won't have to feel like fear is driving you. Because oftentimes, it really is better to roll the dice. Now, if you decide to speak up and to take a risk, then you'll want to be effective in conveying what matters most. You want to be heard and understood. You want your message to have impact. You don't want your delivery to detract from your content. You certainly don't want to cause a defensive reaction that turns your conversation into a conflict. So the short answer is that you need to say what you have to say in a way that is cool-headed, objective, and concise. You may need to set aside your emotional tone. We're coming up on some specific tips for how to say all of this a bit later. Let's just put these initial uh, thoughts here as, as we're covering these five reasons people don't speak up from Dr. Dietert. Okay, now, you might be thinking that you have said this before or you've said something similar and frankly, no one listened. They, they just don't want to hear it. Let's check that. Are you sure, absolutely sure, they did not listen? Maybe they heard you, agreed with you, and are working to make things happen. Certain kinds of things take time, and there could be going on behind the scene that, that you just don't know about. And yes, I totally agree. You are right to think that they should be keeping you updated. But maybe that's not practical or, or possible. Sensitive situations in the workplace have to be handled with discretion. When difficult problems are being tackled, there can be a lot of angst caused when updates are incomplete or when decisions are still in progress. Right or wrong, maybe this isn't the freeze out that, that it feels like it is. Now in those cases, and yes, they certainly do happen, in those cases where someone really did not listen or did not take you seriously, well, shame on them. They were wrong to handle it that way. But don't let their wrong cause you to also do wrong. 
let me tell you a little bit about the Challenger Space Shuttle disaster. Maybe you know a little bit about this, but, but there was a, a congressional investigation, a lot of information that came forward, and here's what was revealed before that disaster took place. That disaster, by the way, happened because of a part on the shuttle called an O-ring. And the O-ring had never been tested in cold temperatures, and there was one engineer who thought it probably would not do its job and that people would be at risk if the O-ring didn't hold up. Fiocol Manufacturing and NASA had a contract with each other. Roger Bougelet worked for the manufacturer, Fiocol, and he's the one who knew about the O-ring and its potential for failure. But NASA and, and um, Fiocol, they were, they were both, Morton Fiocol, they, they were both in a bad situation. They had already delayed the space shuttle launch multiple times. They were under significant pressure because Congress was about to yank funding from NASA because the public had lost some interest in the space shuttle launches. They had this gimmick, this uh, astronaut who was actually a school teacher. And they were in a hurry. They, they wanted to get this in front of the public and be restored to that, that glorious time when NASA could do no wrong. Morton Thiokol was under pressure because their contract for NASA was up for review. So they certainly didn't want to do anything that would disrupt that relationship. Now Roger Bougelet, he wrote some memos. He had some conversations. He felt like no one was listening. And he was right. They were trying to sweep under the rug what he had to say because nobody else really fully understood it or, or believed it. They, they, they didn't want to believe it. But at the moment of truth, when it was time to start the countdown for that launch, Bougelet once more started to say something about this, and he got shut down. And someone from NASA said, is there anybody there who does not think we should launch? And at that critical moment, Roger Bougelet did not speak up. He did not speak up because he felt like no one would listen anyway. Well, as you know, seven people died that day. Who was responsible? Roger blames himself. He feels like he should have spoken up. And he's been on the speaking circuit. He talks about this. He talks about the need to use your voice to focus on doing the right thing regardless of the outcome. If you speak up, you can know that you've done your part. If others ignore what you've said, that's about them. But you do what you can and don't hold back. In fact, repeat what's really important so more people hear it more often. Now, of course, I'm not talking about just any people. Go for quality more than quantity. Talking to colleagues in the kitchen will never accomplish what you're looking for. Invest your time and energy in talking to the right people the ones who can truly do something about the issues you're raising. Finally, out of those five reasons from Dr. Dieter, the, the fifth one was having a perception that speaking up would not be appropriate. And I think this one goes back to those lessons that we've all learned throughout our lives. I know 60-year-old men, mostly men, in one workplace who will not talk to their boss without going through his administrative assistant. Even when they pass each other in the hall, they keep their head down and pass on by. They all agree this is a sign of respect for that CEO. So, you know, the, the whole idea of what's appropriate is really quite specific to a work team and the leader of that team. Sure, we should follow their lead to know what's appropriate, but don't make assumptions. If, if you're deferential to people who don't want or need deference, then it's actually kind of confusing or off-putting to them. That's why this particular CEO told me in confidence that he feels like the members of his team are a little standoffish with him. Complete miscommunication and misunderstanding at the root of that. Now in any group, there are different styles for how people interact with managers and, and with each other. 
Some managers really like to have a casual, spur-of-the-moment conversation. Others prefer that, that appointments be formally set so they can focus their, their full attention on each interaction. And just like people, teams themselves have a certain unspoken way that they interact. In some team cultures, people prefer you to take detailed conversations into a conference room uh, at the end of the day when things aren't so busy. Where other teams have their very best conversations spontaneously in the break room when people take their mid-morning coffee break. So just don't limit yourself by bringing in other people's definitions or your own assumptions about what is respectful. Watch and, and respond to what's happening around you. And remember, the highest measure of respect is that we support those who we respect. And support may mean, in fact, at some point it probably will mean that you share openly with that person. Now let's spend a little more time talking about your decision. Notice the word choice. Right? Speak up has a double meaning because I'm assuming that some of the toughest decisions are about speaking to people who are higher than you on the org chart. And there are some considerations, of course, that you'll want to make when deciding whether or not to use your voice. You'll want to think about your considerations with timing. Is this a good time? What would be a bad time? Think about the setting. Is one-on-one -on -one better? Should it be during office hours that this person holds? Um, is this something to talk about in a public forum like a meeting? And then think about the value of your contribution. Before you speak, ask yourself if what you're about to say will add value. That answer is yes, much more often than not. So your input when it's a value, ought to be out there for consumption. And think, too, about the impact of not speaking. Certainly, you're thinking naturally about the risk of speaking up. But if you're weighing that risk, you also have to look at the other side of the scale, because there's a risk to inaction, to, to not speaking up as well. And then finally, this last one, th this is for you. Even if no one else ever judged you for holding back, the truth is that you're probably judging yourself. If you're not using your voice, you may feel like you've checked out or that you haven't been true to yourself in some way. Now, if you're still wrestling with that decision, should I speak up or not, here are a few additional ways that, that, that you could weigh your options. Ask yourself, do you really believe in, in what you have to say? Is it driven by your values, by what's important to you? Is it more than a fleeting thought or a passing interest? This will help you to pick what matters most. And then consider, well, will others also benefit by hearing this? Right? Think less about that benefit to you or that penalty to you of saying it. Think more about the need for it to be out there. This is your contribution, a way that you allow others to benefit too. Give a lot of thought to this third question. Is this your position or is it someone else's? Don't ever set yourself up to be an advocate for others. If, if you're an advocate for others, well, first of all, others will stop listening when every one of your sentences opens up with a vague reference to other people think. And second, because who are you to rob others of their voice? Help them to find it and use it instead of stepping in to represent them. Everyone is perfectly capable of representing himself or herself, and each individual will always do a better job than any proxy ever could. Give a little thought next to why this matters. You'll certainly be more compelling when you can explain why it matters. You'll be able to talk about the impact and the consequences of what you're commenting on. And that will help others to see that it's more than a complaint. Rather, this is you being helpful to prevent a consequence or to achieve a more satisfying solution, a more positive outcome. Last but not least, always try to include a solution. Right? The difference between whining and helping is that you'll be trying to solve a problem 
versus piling on to a problem that already exists. Here's how to get started. We're getting down to the nuts and bolts now. Once you have decided that you will speak up, you've decided that you will use your voice, these are some tips for getting started. The idea is to make this as simple and as safe as possible for you and to help you be effective in voicing your thoughts. I strongly recommend that you work it out on paper, on your own, alone. That will help you to, to sort through your thoughts and to channel your energy to the place where you're going to have the most impact. As you're preparing, go ahead and set your emotions aside. They won't be very valuable in the heat of the moment. Save those emotions so that you can speak objectively, clearly, and concisely. Part of bringing your emotions out of the conversation are to, to edit out any superlatives, the always, the nevers, the overreaching statements that, that will cause you not to be so credible. So that you're credible and the other person can hear what you have to say, be sure to list concrete, specific examples. Be sure to talk about the impact and, and why this matters and bring in that solution, that alternative, that you think would be a, a better way of looking at this. And then finally, remember, you're all on the same team. There is common ground. Your organizational uh, mission, the, the purpose for your team, the handoffs that, that cause you to need to collaborate, somewhere there's common ground. Start there so that you have an area of agreement and so you demonstrate that you are all on the same side. This is um, an example. Let me give you one. Uh, an example of how this would sound if you put all of this together. Now you want to be sure that this is authentic for you. Authentic for you is going to be what you achieve when you find that common ground and you work through these other steps. If you are giving me feedback, let's say, let's say you were someone that, that um, I'd been coaching and I'd, I'd given you some instruction around the Myers-Briggs type indicator. You might say something like this after a course in, in that. You might say, hey, Deb, I'm, I'm using what you taught us about the MBTI and about the learning styles and preferences a lot. See there, you just set some common ground. It's a very positive starting place. It also includes something very specific instead of something broad about MBTI. Now this next part is really important. This is where you're establishing that there's a positive intention in the conversation. Instead of saying but or however, you would transition by saying something more like this. And I think we could do even more with this to support the team if you notice the difference. It's still positive, still constructive, and I have absolutely no reason to be defensive. What you're about to tell me is something I want to hear now. It's going to want me to, to change and, and to understand what I'm doing because you've described that impact as we could do even more to support the team. So that's where your alternative comes in. It's your suggestion, your idea or request for a change that I would make. Altogether, it would sound just like this. Hey Deb, I'm, I'm using what you taught us about MBTI and especially the learning styles preferences a lot lately. And, and I think that I could do even more with this to support the team if you devoted more time to this part of the workshop so we could have more role play and, and be able to practice with each other. Great idea. I mean, my reaction would probably be very, very positive. Same as most people. If you respond to them in a way that shows them how you're here to help, they can respond to your feedback in a positive way as well. Now that whole part about writing it down, right, that's where it gives you the chance to separate emotion from what will make you effective in your delivery. Writing it down also provides a way for you to check for these six impact ingredients. Be sure it's simple and it's straightforward and it's easy to understand. Make sure what you're about to say is, is candid. This is not the time to sugarcoat or dilute what you want to say. Don't leave any room for doubt about exactly what you mean. Bring in a little empathy. Pause. Think about how the other person might be feeling about the whole situation. 
let them know that, that you're empathetic to, to their plight too. And then, you know, there, there's confidence. That confidence, because you're, you're being balanced and fair, because you're candid, because you're thinking about the bigger picture and how you can help, right? you're going to get some certainty, some confidence from that, from the mental exercise and the written exercise that you're doing in your preparation. The other part of confidence comes from knowing that this thing needs to be said and that you are saying it in an effort to be helpful. And finally, keep it brief. Get to your point quickly. Eliminate any of the big setups and the lengthy examples. There probably are going to be some follow-up questions, so you don't have to pack all of that into your initial feedback. I've mentioned confidence a few times now. So that begs the question, where does confidence come from? That initial surge of confidence that propels you into any conversation comes from knowing this is the right thing to do and from believing in what you have to say. It also comes from the understanding that you have been hired to contribute your education, your experience, and your point of view. Now, once you're in that conversation, you want to maintain a confident and assertive tone. So here are some techniques for doing exactly that. Open with I instead of the word you. After all, this is about your own observations, your own perceptions, your own needs. So own it. And don't cast any blame. Don't speak with any judgments. There's no need to do that. Just, just keep it neutral. And you'll find it's easier to remain confident as well as being easier for the other person to hear what you're saying, too. Do not start with an apology. It's not true. You're not sorry for taking up someone else's time. You're not bothering anybody. You have nothing to apologize for. In fact, you're bringing a gift to the other person. An apology simply doesn't fit this conversation. Try to stay objective. This is where your prep work will give you an extra measure of confidence. And then finally, keep your underlying intention in mind. Fuel your own confidence by reminding yourself that this is for the greater good. You are part of a team. Both of you are together in this team, and ultimately you want the very same things. To convey your confidence, you can also plan in some strong phrasing. Notice the differences in the replacement phrases versus the ones in the first column. These phrases over here on the right-hand side, they make it clear that you firmly believe in what you're going to say next. They command attention. When you set up what you're offering with weak phrases like those on the left, they make it sound like, like you doubt yourself, and then you're less likely to be taken seriously. These phrases on the right assert your belief and show the strength of your position. Let's talk just a little bit more about being assertive. This is for you. Uh, be sure and, and capture a screenshot of this and, and use this long term to gauge where you are. We have um, a measure here in the middle, a measure of what it feels like in six different ways, what's happening when you're assertive. What I mean by being passive is when you're not saying anything at all, when you're holding back. Being assertive is when you're stating what you need, and you're also respecting what others need as well. On the far right side, well, that's going too far. That's being aggressive. That's demanding what you need and trampling on what other people need. Some people feel like they're being aggressive when, if, and in fact, they're barely being assertive. So that's why a tool like this can be very helpful. Conversely, some people feel they are asserting themselves when, in fact, they've crossed the line and they're truly being aggressive. These indicators will help you assess where you are in any given situation. You'll notice that 
Many of these pertain to how you're feeling. That's because our feelings really do drive our actions. See, we have lots of influences. Our experiences, our operating systems from, from childhood homes and, and from school systems, they lead us to, to form what we believe. Our beliefs result in behaviors that impact outcomes. But there's good news. You, you get to choose your behaviors. You don't get to choose those past experiences. You aren't going to change the fact that you grew up in certain systems and that your beliefs were formed. But you do have the ability to question your beliefs and to modify your behaviors, even as you're mindful of those beliefs and experiences that drive your behaviors. But you get to decide if that's what you really want to do. When it comes to being assertive, you may have to examine your beliefs and determine how they're affecting your behaviors. Because the outcomes you want will be driven by the behaviors that you choose. So just like we said about fear, you can't let beliefs override reason and situational needs for you to adopt different behaviors. When you use your voice, you have a, a much higher likelihood of influencing an outcome. One behavior you may wish to choose more often then is the behavior of speaking up and using your own unique voice to assertively communicate your needs. I hope you found this presentation to be helpful. Like anything though, it's only as good as your utilization of it. So as you begin trying on the various tips and techniques offered here, please remember that you're not alone. My email address is right there on screen. I offer coaching for leaders at every level. You may wish to engage me in a six-week or a 13-week coaching program to help you kick this into high gear. Or you may wish to, to just ask me a single question or, or for some additional resources. Look, I, I don't charge for that. I'm, I'm happy to help you, and you won't get any high-pressure sales pitch. I genuinely believe in the power of putting people first. And I'd be, I'd be delighted if we connected. And if we don't connect directly, well, let's at least get connected on social media. My Twitter handle is on screen, and, and you can easily find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Google+, and, and YouTube. Don't forget to check out the Connect to Lead blog and our newsletter. We release new content like this regularly, so please take advantage of all of it. And while you're at it, here's a great way to practice using your voice. How about helping us by spreading the word about the Connect community and the tools like this that we offer?